people. And if you're watching live, checking us out on YouTube, or listening on your favorite podcast provider, you are most definitely my people. Welcome to another episode of Botch Pots and Share Shots. We still have high hopes of delivering quality wrestling content, and if not, we'll sprinkle in two guys that know more about wrestling than I do. You know, so we still get over. I'm your host, a chef by trade and a mark by choice. I am the Will Gray, and I'm glad to be here on this journey. And joining me tonight, he is one of the hosts of the Young Kings Wrestling. He is the ravishing Reek Rude. He is the nature boy Reek Flair. He is the one, the only Tyreek Yates. Reek, how are you, bro? Heck, how are you, bro? Oh. That is two shows in two weeks. I just realized you are also muted, so now everybody <laughs> can hear you guys. Uh, they heard me fine, but they didn't hear you yell. <laughs> um... Gentlemen, we're just going to keep rolling with it because this is live. Uh, I start the the show every time the same way. Uh, both of you have been on an episode or two. Uh, I always ask, what has you pissed off for greatness this week in the world of pro wrestling? Reek, I'm going to hand it off to you because you're the uh, the newest guest, I guess with the fewest attendances. Um, RN, <laughs> RN's an old yeah. head here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, impending doom. Impending doom. Uh, well, at least what, well, on the surface, that's what it is. Uh, the bloodline got caught slipping and lying and uh it's not looking good for him friday night but at least that's the perception because you know uh there's there swerves all around the corner so yeah friday is gonna be a, a movie which it has been since the bloodline started so that's uh that's something big to, to keep an eye out for for me i think the bloodline is the most intriguing thing in wrestling right now i think that's fair at least in wwe for oh, yeah. sure yeah yeah for sure yeah i haven't i haven't seen uh a long-term story that they've built like this. I mean, since I started watching, honestly. RN, what about you, brother? What's got you pissed off for greatness tonight? Uh, I ain't really pissed off about nothing, honestly. Like, I I mean, again, I, the bloodline shit, I wish we could have waited for the Sammy stuff until after WrestleMania. Like, I guess I am pissed about that. Like, it's taking a little bit, little bit of the shine from Cody, even though him and Paul had that awesome fucking promo. But it's just, like, it's too much in the way of it sandwiched in. And I, I feel like it's taken away from everything we could have got with Cody. Like, I know Cody's going to make it work, and I like how they're throwing Paul and him in, you know what I'm saying? Like, kind of still keep us going with it and still just let remind us that it is Cody that's at the end of the road. You know what I'm saying? But... But I just feel like I know they had to run with it because it was hot and that's what happened. But I feel like, like I said, I think it's just taken away from the build we could have got if it was all squarely put on Cody. So, but other than that, I mean, I'm not mad about it. I'm more maybe, a, I don't know, indifferent about it. I wouldn't say mad. <laughs> you're not mad. You're just disappointed. Right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> let, me, cool. let me ask you guys a question then. Uh, do you think they could have... Do you think the bloodline was strong enough in story to have stretched all the way to WrestleMania and then have the Sammy turn happen at WrestleMania? So the Sammy versus Roman is right after WrestleMania? Or do you think that would have made it go too long? Bro, he spent six months trying to get into the bloodline. We forget that. Like, it wasn't like they just (laughs) threw him in there. Like, he literally was courting them and, like, trying to help them out and do shit for literally six months. Like... Yeah. That's the part everybody like always tries to like gl- not gloss over. But we forget like it wasn't like he just automatically was there. Like he was trying to win them over for half of last year. You know what I'm saying? So like we could have definitely stretched out. Like my thing is like I hate that we're so impatient and we always want everything to fucking implode. Like from Street Profits to New Day to anything that's like good. We're always waiting on who's going to be the fucking Marty Jannetty. You know what I'm saying? Like why can't we just enjoy some shit like they could have definitely stretched this out. We could have got some more uh, questionable moments with Sammy, even some questionable moments with Roman within the bloodline, and then have Sammy cost him the title. So then that way we can at least split the title, get the titles back split up. And then then you got Sammy versus uh, Roman. Going, you can drag that shit out all the way to Sam- SummerSlam back and forth for the universal title. Like, I just feel like I know it was hot, and you kind of had to strike while you can with it because it was so unexpected and everything. With it. Because I think they said it was only supposed to be like two weeks when he first yeah. started doing his bloodline shit. Now we're at almost a year and a, a year and a few months. You know what I'm saying? But like, I feel like they should have did it like that. Like it was too fucking predictable at the Rumble. Like you know what I'm saying? Like they should have threw us a swerve. But but that's just me. Like I said, everybody acts like I'm crazy for thinking that way. But it's just like we don't have to break up everything that's good. Like 
we all know, like we all just said it right here. This is the best storyline in wrestling. It's the only reason why anyone watches fucking ass ass SmackDown. Like, why do we have to end it? Like, why can't we just ride this shit out till it just isn't there anymore? Like, but again, we always want to see everything good in wrestling break up or happen. We want to, you know what I'm saying? Like, and I, I hate that shit. Like, with a passion. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they they definitely could have stretched this because, like, like he said, Sammy has been that dude outside the club trying to get in because he didn't have no swag for a very long time. Yeah. So now that he's, I mean, he's only been technically in like accepted since November. Right. So I mean, it's <laughs> been that long. Like, God damn. Yeah. Man. So I mean, you could have, you could have definitely like uh, Elimination Chamber is a filler pay per view. You could have right. had anyone be a stand in for that, and you could have still had the thing with Cody, and you know, Sammy's just another one of the guys off to the side, and it's like. I don't think it's going to happen, but if you wanted to keep Roman holding the titles past Mania, you could have used Sammy to help him do that. Like, th- mm-hmm. this feud could have been carried as long as you really needed it, too, as long as the fans respond to it. The second they get disinterested, that's when you got to start pulling the plug. But right. this was fine for as long as you could have had it. And you didn't need to have a world title match. Like, Roman ain't been doing shit anyway. That could have been an intercontinental title match. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, they're already propping up the U.S. title for all. Like, it could have been a dope-ass banger. You know what I'm saying? Like a uh, U.S. title. I mean, not U.S. So intercontinental match or intercontinental uh, chamber match, too. You know what I'm saying? Like there's other there's plenty of ways you could have got around it where you didn't have to book this match. Could have had Gunther run it with Roman. I would love to see that. Yeah, like, like I said, there's plenty of things you could have done where we could have just kept drawing this out. You know what I'm saying? Like Allison says that they uh it's ending because Roman wants an extended break completely off of TV and that I think they need to end it while it's good and not wait till it sucks before they take it off TV. Um, I can agree with the get it out of here while it's fresh kind of thing. I, I can agree with that for the most part. Uh, Bama but but says, you really think it's going to be over, though? You really no, think it's over? At, at, it's not. Like, come on, man. That's my thing. It's like, yeah, it's easy to say that. And like, you know what I'm saying? Like, sounds good to say, but like, do you really fucking think it's over? Like, that's just it. Like, Sammy's, he spent all this time trying to get down with them, to real with them, be around with them. Then Jimmy and all that shit going on too. Like, it's not going to be over. So like, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's cool to say, but it's really not going to be over. Like, I guarantee you next night on Raw or that Friday or SmackDown, they're going to have, Sammy's going to have something to do with the bloodline. Like, it's not just going to just disappear. Uh, oh yeah, just, have, oh, just go ahead. Say nothing go ahead. more than it's, it's nothing more than a long intermission, and the, the 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 vibe that I've been getting since like at least early December is that Sammy, at some point in time, is going to fall back with Kevin, and they're going to challenge the Usos. Right. And realistically, whatever happens at Elimination Chamber is going to set that up. So uh, th- this is yeah, this is not going to go anywhere anytime soon. Uh, Bama says, what if Sammy's still on the inside and this is all just part of the bigger story? Uh, Bobby's getting filtered out because of uh, using certain words. I'm going to play mod. (laughs) Um, My pissed off for greatness is a little bit of uh, an irony thing. You got to see the irony here because uh, I write for a dirt sheet. I do shoot interviews every day with pro wrestlers that kind of pull the curtain back. Um, kind of everything I do in a certain way exposes the business. And I'm saying that loosely because that's a term that gets thrown around. But what has me pissed off for greatness this week is Moxley getting caught on camera blading and it becoming such a big deal. And then immediately him tonight in the match bleeding within the first three minutes of the match. And like, he didn't even give us time to forget that he got caught blading he just immediately just went along with it like it never happened. And I'm not saying, like, kayfabe is real, it's real to me, damn it. Like I said, I understand that I pull the curtain back every day, but he could have at least given it, like, a week to breathe before he decided he was going to blade on TV again. It just seemed like he just doesn't give a fuck anymore. I mean, you know, I did, my thing is, like, with him, like, he's, I'm falling back into where I'm starting to hate the dude. I'm not even going to lie. Well, that that's, like... That's the, the the vibe around the whole company. Like we we've talked about that on our show. Like the, this need for consistently given color, you know, at least every other match. It's like John, uh, Mox is just one repeat offender. There's several guys in there that just can't help themselves. 
it's like you, you feel like uh, it's almost like you've been deprived of it everywhere else that you just got to do it right. at a moment's notice Should whenever it's like uh, oh yeah absolutely <laughs> it's just like but but it just it does it doesn't call for it that much I, one thing i said about it is that if you have a situation if you have a, a match or a storyline that's gotten heated like that or something that's gotten serious or a crazy match okay fine you know, it's just to add to the the drama of it, but it's not just like, oh, well, these two just having a match and whoop, slip the wrist. Now all of a sudden he bleed. Like, no, it's, that's never been necessary. Uh, it's just, it's just another more back to AEW overthinking everything. And like, same with Mox. Like he had, he had won me over for a while, but now this like, fucking Mick Foley ass, whatever the fuck he's trying to be, like bleeding every match and everything. Like it's like, like come on, bro, like. It's not necessary, and especially going against jobbers and shit like whoever the hell he was going against tonight with uh, uh, Los Ingobernadores. I always I always fuck that up, but like it was like I don't even know who dude is, but it's like bro, like he's not somebody that should give John Moxley color. Like it's I don't understand that theme either. That at the last several times I watched the John Moxley match, I had no idea who was on the other side, and I don't think that's what you brought this man here to do. There's so many other promoters from the, and I'm not the guy standing on my porch screaming, get off my lawn, even though that seems to be who I am week over week a lot of times. Uh, A lot of those guys back in the day wouldn't put that kind of stuff on TV because it's building and building anticipation for something and making you want it. And when you bleed, it makes it seem like that was the payout for something huge. If you do it every single week, it loses all meaning behind what it means. And I feel like Moxley's now bleeding is so much part of his gimmick. If he doesn't do it in a match, then it's almost like, eh, was it really a Moxley match? Uh, Basically. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> no, um, I mean that's that's it for me. Like it's yeah, like none of his matches. Like now it's just like that's the thing. It's bleed, flip the camera off, uh, DDT, oh, and keep it moving. You know what I'm saying? It's like it's five moves of doom. Is that one of his moves is to bleed? Yeah. Uh, Bobby says Flair never bled for the Mulkey brothers. I'm pretty sure Bobby's the only one old enough to know who the Mulkey brothers are. <laughs> devil's advocate in a shoot fight within three minutes of a standard match someone is probably going to bleed from a punch or a kick so is wwe too unrealistic and fake in quotations because they never bleed and aw is more realistic because punches will make you bleed um Uh, wwe WWE is just pg that's that's just (laughs) clearly that person clearly that person ain't never been in that ain't been in that many fights because they're i'm be honest with you i have seen a lot of fights i've been in a few fights Everybody don't bleed every fight. Sometimes yeah, nah. you just get knocked the fuck out. Like, yeah, that's true. You know what I'm saying? Like, there, it's not a bleeding thing. You definitely you don't see somebody get busted in the forehead, but gush blood every time somebody gets in a fight. Yeah. So it's like, nah, bro, that ain't it either. If you see blood in WWE, it's a legitimate accident. Yeah, uh, Bobby said, I it, when they bleed in WWE, it means something. Meaning, like, it was either A, they did it the hard way and it wasn't on purpose, or B, it yeah. was supposed to be the payout, big payoff, Brock Lesnar, Becky Lynch. I mean, even the Becky Lynch nose bust was a complete right. shoot. Like, it wasn't supposed to happen that way. Yeah. Right. And then Brock's psycho ass, he actually well, ran his head into something hard, which I, I don't know. That dude was it's different. But that that that's all that's all that is. Like ever since 2008, they said, and really, really, you can, you can blame Sean for that because Sean overdid it in that match with uh, Jericho, and damn, there bled himself like Eddie style. About bled so, out, just call it what it was. Like yeah, yeah, I hadn't seen one that bad since Eddie in like back in 04. So I mean, that's when they kind of said, like, let me let's let up on that. I'm gonna be honest with you. I don't need blood at all. If I'm being 100 percent honest, like unless it's like some shit like GCW, or you know what I'm saying, like some a hardcore match or TLC or something like that, where you're like getting hit with objects where it can happen. Like, but I don't need like the Daniel Bryan match last week. Like that was fucking ignorant to me. Like it, there was no reason for that man, and not to mention like the style of wrestling that he does. Like, there's no reason for you to be in a bloody match like that, especially who you're going against. Like, yeah, I, like like to me is it's overdone and like I don't. I don't need it. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, it, unless it's like a match, like you said, like, or a blow off on something where, or to set something up, like, damn, they beat his ass so bad he's bleeding. What's yeah. he going to do next to get back on? Like, something like that, I understand. But just a normal damn TV match every Wednesday. So some dude bleeding buckets, 
messing up the damn ring and shit and everything. Like, I, like it's it's unnecessary to me. And like, I'm the old man on the porch today. Like, it, it's fucking dumb. No, it's true. Like, you you want it to punctuate a rivalry, shock and awe, or a big blow off match, a hell in a cell, a street fight, an I quit match. You know, stuff like situation like that you anticipate it. But if it's not to do that, you just want to elevate whatever program you're in. Like when uh, Kevin Owens headbutted Vince, like. That makes sense. Dude's got a big ass head, and this is a seven year old man. You expect some blood to come, but that's a that's a, that's a scenario where it fits. Right, right. Uh, rounding it out before we head into the the piece of news and rumors, uh, Hogan Cena Rock bled very little. Austin bled often, but it always meant something. Uh, Brian, Katie says Brian is bleeding a lot because he never got to do it in WWE. So he was kind of like milking the opportunity now, maybe. Um, well, I will I will counter that because as much as I don't give a shit about Terry <laughs> um compared to the rest of the crew, uh, Terry when he when he did bleed, he bled a lot. Like Brock squeezed the juice out of him and rubbed it on his chest like a a wild predator. Like a fucking barbarian. And, yeah. And, you know, Rock, we, we saw like like Mania seventeen, he had a whole bath going and then Cena I, I was just talking about uh, Eddie and Judgment Day. The very next year, Cena had the I Quit match with JBL. His whole face was covered. So, yeah, they didn't bleed a lot on you know regularly, but when they did bleed, they made sure they added that extra oomph to it. Mm-hmm. Agreed. Uh, all right, guys. Super Bowl was on Sunday. Over the next ten or twelve or thirteen days, call it two weeks. Uh, there's some major wrestling events going down. Um, elimination chamber for the WWE. We got Sammy versus Roman battle in the Valley. We got Jay White's last new Japan match. Mercedes Monet making her in ring debut for new Japan pro wrestling. AEW's revolution is the first week in March next week. We've got impacts. No surrender. There's just nothing but good wrestling coming down the pipes. Do you guys have one particular show though, that you guys are most excited about that's coming down? Yeah. Elimination chamber. Yeah. You think that's the biggest one of them right now? Best stories? Yeah. You know, I, I forgot that uh, Mercedes was having that match this weekend. So, like, that's up there. But it's still, I'm still, like, keying in on what happens between Roman and Sammy. I mean, we know what's going to happen. But it's like, that's that's destination viewing. But I'm going to still keep my eye out for Mercedes because, you know, I, I've always been a fan. And I love that she's over there. You know, her and Kyrie over in Japan, like that's going to be something special. But it's, it's actually in the states. But, but uh, no, nah, I ain't even worried about the Sammy and Roman match. Like to me, the the Brock and Bobby match, and then the United States uh, elimination chamber match. Because I feel like this is kind of where we uh, where Austin got his big breakout, even though he was getting his ass beat by Brock. I feel like this is going to be either it's either going to be Montez's coming out party, or they're going to try something with uh, Damian I Priest. That. I need that. I, it, it's about damn time we we gave Montez the showcase, and like yeah. honestly, everyone else in there has got it. Right. Like Priest has already been champ. Rollins has been champ. Austin is the champ. Like, uh, who's uh, Dolph is in there? Like, yeah. We 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 don't need nobody else to get their shine at this moment, but. Tez. So the thing I, mean, I hate about the Street Profit shit is like if you really pay attention, Tez is not the one that does the mic work or does any of the hype shit that you remember about the Street Profits. You remember him acting a fool in the ring doing the fucking uh Ultimate Warrior shit yeah. that thing, but the actual talent behind the the Street Profits, which no one seems to recognize, I guess to me, is fucking Dawkins. Right. He's he's the one that talks in the back. He's the one that does pro- promotes and pumps up anything whenever they got the street pops there. The only thing fucking Montez does is shuck and jive and fucking uh, look like an idiot half the time. Like the real talent in the street profits is fucking Dawkins. I, I gotta I gotta lay off of Dawkins because I have been saying for the longest time that if they decide to break up the street profits, which they don't need to do, but if that day comes, we know Tez is the star. But uh, the last few months, like Dawkins has been out here in these bro. matches, has been killing. I'm like, hey, bro, he does the whole match. Tez only does the hot tag for the last five minutes of the match. It's literally Dawkins. And my thing is, too, now he's 
that's how it's been in the ring. But I'm talking about backstage. Think about all the shit the street when they had the street poppers doing stuff. The mm. person that was doing the talking, the majority of the talking, was Dawkins. It wasn't Tez. Like, and nobody seems to remember that or get that. That it's not really Tez. You just remember him because he's loud and ignorant. And like I said, he's such an athlete in the ring. But like you just said, like these matches have all been Dawkins. And then Tez comes and gets the hot tag and then gets his fucking move off. But it's really been Dawkins carrying the fucking matches and carrying them on the mic. And like, I don't understand how no one else sees this and like how it's like, like I feel like I'm, I'm a crazy person pointing this out. Like, bro, like, how do y'all not see this shit? Like, I like, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's like, and don't get me wrong, I'm not saying Tez ain't that guy and that he ain't eventually probably gonna be that guy. Oh, yeah, you know is. what I'm saying? Like, for real. But I think we cut off, we we cut Dawkins at, off at the knees automatically just because of who Tez is and like his energy and his presence. But really, the workhorse of that fucking group is Dawkins not, by far 110%. Like, and nobody can tell me any different. I've been saying this a long time in regards to those two, that this isn't a Marty Jannetty, Shawn Michaels situation. What no. we're looking at here is a Butch Reed, Ron Simmons situation from Doom, where you've got two guys that could potentially be world champions, and it's not a matter of 1A, one and one a, so to speak. It's a matter of who gets the rocket on their back and then performs right. with it. Because I could see both these guys having... One guy goes after the IC title and one guy goes after the U.S. title. Like, you know what I mean? Like, either one of them would be believable as mid-card champions without question. So I think this is a Butch Reed, Ron Simmons more so than a Marty Jannetty versus uh, Shawn Michaels thing. Because I don't see either of these guys not being a star once they once they break up and go into right. the, the singles. And Dawkins yeah. taking it serious, getting his body together, too. Like, you can tell the transformation, like him actually putting in the work and shit. And I think that's a lot of why, too, why they have him being... I guess kind of like the workhorse in the matches because he is like getting his shit together. He is getting his body right. Like and, and like I said to me, like I, I'm not saying Tez ain't that guy because he is. He's a fucking <laughs> total bona fide package. Stars, one hundred. This guy, he just has yeah. it. Whatever the fuck that is, he has it. But that workhorse dude, that dude that I would throw my money on is Dawkins. Montez will be a world champion, Same. but Dawkins would be that guy that would be that long reigning IC mid card, held a bunch of tag titles. He's right. going to be that guy, you know? Like, Tez will get a world title because Tez has that world champion personality. Not that Dawkins right. doesn't. Dawkins is the reason why WWE could stand to have a world heavyweight title again, like the big gold belt. Because somebody like Dawkins would be perfect for the big gold belt because he's a good worker, you know? Like, he's, like, kind of edge in that 2000 and, you know, late 2000s run before he got hurt. You know what I mean? Like, he's that kind of guy. He goes out there and he works. He's he can talk, but he doesn't cut those ten minute banger promos. He gets in, he says what he needs to, and then he beats people's asses in the ring. Like good timing, think, he's got decent move sets, and he can work as a tag or a singles competitor. Dawkins is just as big a star as Tez. Tez just has the look. Dawkins got Triple H vibes to me, like when it was Shawn Michaels, China, Triple H DX. Like I feel that's how I feel about Dawkins. Like he's got that Triple H behind him where you know he's just that secondary guy. But there's a chance, like if given the, if if you give him the chance, I think that he's gonna surprise a lot of people and he's gonna get some world championships out of it. If given the right opportunities, you know that shit has to line up. You know what I'm saying? But like, well, look that's at what Sean I, and Hunter. Sean got his saying. push that's, in the late '90s. Then Hunter really took off after that 2000s run with Mankind. Right. You know, like I'm, it was just that few years later. That's a perfect analogy. Yeah. Let that's, Tez that's get the I'm run now, at. and then Dawkins gets over in 18 months, two years from now, when it's his turn. And we don't have to break them up. They don't have to be broken up to do their thing. Like, they just, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, we don't have to break them up. Because really, I don't think we've really got a real legitimate Street Profits run. I don't even though they've been on the main roster forever and they're, like, fully entrenched. And, like, that's what we think of mainly when you think of tag teams now in the WWE. But, like, we, we they haven't got a substantial run with the belts where they're fucking, like, the Usos are doing now. Like, they haven't got that run yet. So, like, no. that's my thing, too, about how people want to break them up. Like, we ain't even really seen them. On no real tag team shit, honestly. Like, then we're hitting on all cylinders, beating everybody, and everybody coming at them and shit. Like, would they have the belts for like a month last time when they won them? I think so. It wasn't a long. And I think they only defended it once. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's like, so can we at least get some street profits, fucking tag team action stuff before y'all break them up? Like, that's how I feel about it. Agreed. All right, gentlemen, uh, we're gonna switch it over now to the main focus of the conversation. Um, which is kind of a, 
a celebration of Black History Month. And like I said, I really appreciate you guys coming on. We're going to talk about this now. Um, I titled the episode From Sweet Georgia Brown to Bianca Belair, which is ironic that the one of the first major black female world champions was Sweet Georgia Brown, and now the current reigning Raw Women's Champion is Bianca Belair. So I kind of like the fact that there were two females that I got to use. The first one was a female, and the current reigning one is female. So I thought that was kind of cool. Uh, but it won't just be females. Uh, I'm going to start this conversation with you guys, specifically with the IC Championship. For a long time, the Intercontinental title was kind of branded as the worker's title, one of the best uh, people with the best work rates, best overall work, cut good promos, the kind of workhorse for the company, the next person in line for the, the heavyweight title. Uh, throughout WWE, WWF history, there's been 11 uh, you know, black intercontinental champion starting with ahmed johnson in 96 it was ahmed johnson rocky maivia the rock the godfather Dilo brown booker t shelton benjamin kofi kingston ezekiel jackson which i have a special mark for because we're going to talk about him when we get there Big E and apollo cruz so just kind of uh your first impressions when i rattle off those 11 names uh what do you think about those 11 guys that have held the ic championship as soon as you said I see, I immediately thought of uh, Ahmed Johnson. I ain't even gonna front, like, because <laughs> like, I was trying to think of like, because I was gonna say The Rock too, but you no, know, he don't claim to be a nigga, even though he is. So like, we gotta just kind of cut him out uh, off the list. But like, that was the first person I really thought of, because I was trying to think, because I was gonna say D'Lo too, but I think of more like the European Championship with D'Lo. You know what I'm saying? So like, yeah, Ahmed Johnson was definitely who I was, who I who came to mind first when you said Black Intercontinental Champion. Yeah, it, it makes you go back and think about that time period where, you know, the IC title really was that work rate title, you know, because, you know, when I think of like, you know, for me, it, it, earliest memories go back when I think of, you know, uh, black wrestlers that, you know, were representatives is like obviously The Rock. By the time I started watching, he was already past that point, but it was like, you just, you saw that progression that, that, that came out of it. You know, this is a guy that initially he starts off and he wasn't, wasn't getting that love because of the name, because of the look, whatever it was, it just wasn't it. But you know, that was that was when it was it was important. It was like you sought after that the IC title, and then like guys like Shelton Benjamin, where I mean, I say to this day he should have gotten a world title run off of the work that he was doing with that title between him and uh, facing likes of Chris Jericho, Christian Edge, like I mean, so, someone who was so naturally talented. And, you know, people forget, like, he came in, you know, along with Brock Lesnar and everything like that in OVW. So it's like he's he's one of the more gifted talents, but it's like he fit in there just perfectly. We just never took that next step. But that, that work that he did with those titles was just something that, you know, you could never take back. And, you know, everybody on this list, you know, got their due. You know, they didn't always get the next step up to get to the world title, but... They they really were great representatives for the mid card because, you know that that's where the best work gets done. That's where you find out who your next stars are. Uh, looking at Shelton's run, that was the gold standard. Shelton, when he held the IC title, it was the most the longest reign in the two thousands era. It only just got recently beat by Gunther. Um, Kofi had a great run too in 2008, which was his only, no, I think he had two IC title runs. Um, these last few in the Kofi Shelton, uh, Big E all had, you know, those were like Big E had the first one. And then when he got the second IC title reign, it was right before he got that world title push. So it kind of goes with what we were talking about. He got the IC title. He ran with it for a little bit. Then he got that push with the money in the bank. Um, my question, you brought up The Rock. Both of you mentioned him. Uh, I had him on here twice because he won it as Rocky Maivia, and that was when he was the baby face. Nobody liked him. He couldn't get over, boot out of the ring. He got injured. Then he came back and joined the Nation of the Domination and was The Rock. Uh, just what do you guys think the biggest differences were in the success rate? And do you think if he stayed Rocky Maivia, he would have been the, the same guy? I... I... There's it's night and day because, you know, you see it even nowadays, like guys that try to do the whole white me baby face thing. Some people are natural out of some people aren't. But it's just it was just something about when Rock came out and started voicing what he felt. 
You know, it's it wasn't just like, oh, I got to pander to you guys because I'm the baby face. That's what I'm supposed to do. No, no, no. It's like y'all just came out here and just shit on me uh, just out of thin blue air just because, you know, I had the, the smile on my face and everything like that. You know, it it, it kind of was the vibe of the time. Like we were getting into the attitude era and here is this guy who's supposed to be a baby face showing you that attitude. So it's like Rocky Maivia might have gone a little bit as a face but there was a ceiling there was always a ceiling to it rock was sky was the limit by the time you it whether he stayed in nation or he broke out it was just like you could see that 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 one had the most mileage to run with and even as he take over took over as the leader of the nation he kicks out for rook now it's like okay wow you you really have something here with this guy so I, I I don't think that there was any way that Rocky could have been as a face anywhere near what the Rock was. Let me ask I you just, guys. Oh, go ahead, Arian. You go first, would, and then I'll ask y'all a question. I would. My thing with him is though, there's the fact that he doesn't really like identify or fuck with being black. You know what I'm saying? Like he he only cl- claims it's Samoan. So it's like for me, like that's always been like a point of contention for me, and like how much I love the Rock, the actor, the wrestler, all of that. But like the fact that he does not pay any homage or like like give any type of like credence to the fact that yeah but you was a nigga bro your daddy's name is rocky johnson bro. i was gonna like, say rocky johnson was pretty straightforward with who he was as a person you know yeah, like, yeah. Mean, that was, anybody that was, who I knows mean, history about wrestling and i'm saying that as you know as a wrestling historian anybody who knew anything about wrestling history like rocky johnson didn't try to be anything other than who rocky johnson no, was he was about as uh, i'm a i'm pro i'm a black pro wrestler as there can fucking get and the rock does not like like I said, he doesn't acknowledge that whatsoever. So, like, to me, like, that's always been, like, a sore spot for me. Like, I'm like, I don't want to, like, because we, and no one even says it, too. Like, they always say that Samoan shit when they talk about his championships and all that. But, like, he's a black man, too. But he don't yeah. look at himself as a black man. So, like, for me, like, I always disqualify him from any type of, like, conversation because he disqualifies himself from it. So, you know what I'm saying? So, like, I don't even take Creedence in or really pay attention to it. Like, he just, you know what I'm saying? Like, I, I don't know. It's, it's always been a point of contention for me. Well, that, that that's it's it's always for for that family in particular. It's always the Samoan side first because you you know like a lot of them dudes are mixed, with, you know, and everything like that. But at the end of the day, it's like that that heritage, that dynasty is what always comes first. So it's like yeah, but I'm I, and, and I agree with what you're saying too. I'm gonna be honest with you though, honestly, like I don't think any of those other guys would be like that. I mean, they all got black wives and black kids and shit. Like I don't think any of them would not like acknowledge their other half of who they are like i don't you know what i'm saying like i think that's just him because i swear to god like i mean let you see how jimmy and all these dudes are outside like they niggas oh, yeah. to be honest <laughs> you really think that you know what i'm saying like they would not like i don't want to say dishonor but disassociate the other half of who they are like he does and i'm i think that that's literally and i know a lot of it probably is too also the times he was coming up in and things on TV and how literally there were no fucking black champions whatsoever, especially when he was coming up. So like, I get it to a certain extent, but like, I'm sorry. I just don't see Roman and them like not acknowledging the fact that they, they were half black if they were, you know what I'm saying? Like, I just don't see that. I don't see them guys act like that. Definitely not (coughs) Jimmy and Jay's black ass. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. They definitely come into the barbecue. Like (laughs) I don't see them not, you know what I'm saying? Saying that part, if they were half black as well, if that if that makes sense. That's true. Um, let's talk about the nation for a second, since we're kind of hanging out in this late, that mid-90s, late-90s push in the Attitude Era. Ran by Farouk, Ron Simmons, who was the first black champion in WCW in the early 90s. You had D'Lo Brown, the godfather was Kamala. You had Rocky Maivia, you had Ahmed Johnson. All four of these guys held the IC title at one point. All four of them came out of the Nation of Domination. We know the superiority that Farouk had with, uh, you know, the uh, the Acolytes when him and uh, JBL had their run. Uh, let's talk about the, the Nation of Domination and kind of how they influenced... Uh, pro wrestling while also kind of being a, a force for the culture at that point too. Just call it what it is. Yo, D'Lo yeah. Brown is one of mm. the most underrated wrestlers and performers of that entire fucking era. Like I, he's in my top 10 favorite wrestlers of all time. That European title run, even though it ain't shit now, but like he carried that belt. He carried that division, his style, his athleticism, his fucking, the, not, the head coming to the ring and everything like that. His moveset, like 
he was doing some moves that dudes his size normally didn't do. Like doing, and that includes power moves and high flying moves. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think he was an innovator, and I think that he never gets the flowers he deserves because of who all was in that group. And like, he always kind of, because even Godfather to a certain extent became a bigger star than D'Lo ever was. But that was because a nigga he was pimping hoes. You know what I'm saying? But like, mm-hmm. <laughs> but like, you know what I'm saying? But like, I feel like he gets a raw deal in that because there were so many stars and world champions to be honest to come out of that group. But yeah, to me, like D'Lo Brown was the the diamond in the rough in that entire group, and I, like, still to this day, like, I think that he gets he doesn't get anywhere near the respect he deserves for being a workhorse in that era. Yeah, to to me, I think the effectiveness was two pronged because, you know, on one hand, yeah, obviously, you know, they were a voice for the culture, they were channeling that that Black Panther spirit. But on the other side of it, it's like you had a bunch of wrestlers who, you know. They had gimmicks that were just goofy. Like Ron Simmons debuted after being a world champion in WCW. Like you said, he comes into WWE now, and he's uh, what was it like Spartacus or something like that? They had it. They gave him the, the, the this his helmet on. Had him looking Everybody all crazy. Had a ridiculous gimmick or like a profession yeah. and job at that point. Trash man and Repo Man and you know the yeah. burglar and shit. Like it's <laughs> like you get you gave me this goofy stuff to work with. You know, Godfather was Papa Shango and also which was a good gimmick. But it's like he's larger than life cartoon characters. Call it what yeah. it was, you know. Yeah, it's like we, it's like we felt like we're not being taken seriously. So now, now that we're getting a little uncomfortable for some people, we're getting a little taboo on TV. Now you got to take us seriously. So I, that, well, from both of those angles, this is what really hit home. And you know, they just they really developed some stars. And I, I agree, D'Lo was so highly underrated because you know even. Even after the nation and stuff like that, he did not get the love that he deserved. But I mean, yeah, that 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 group definitely hit on all cylinders at this time. Uh, Booker T as an IC champion. Do oh. either of you remember a Booker T IC championship reign? Because when I looked it up and I was looking through my list and doing my due diligence, for some reason I saw it and I was like, that makes sense. He's a Grand Slam champion or whatever. But then I was also like, I don't remember him holding the belt. It was in 03, so shortly after the merger. Uh, do either of you remember that IC title ring? I no. didn't. I didn't until because because I, I I tell TC this all the time. I watch I watch back 03, and I watched him beat Christian, and I was shocked. I'm like, when the hell did this happen? <laughs> so I didn't remember it happened until I rewatched it, but it was only for like a couple weeks or something like that. But still, like, wins a win, it counts. But I, I had no idea it happened. Man, fuck Booker T, bro. I always remembered Booker for his US title rings. That was. That was where it really, you know, I take my my longest memories from it because you know he had a Booker whole bunch. Booker T is of... a Jason Whitlock of wrestling, bro. I, I don't even, I like, I don't even want to talk about him at all. Like, I don't want to say he's dead to me, but like, nothing Booker T. Like Booker T has destroyed any credibility that I had. And I loved Harlem Heat. My family's from New York. My pops and them didn't even realize I had to tell them, bro. That dude's from Texas, bro. But like they, because he was Harlem Heat, and that's where they were from and grew up. Like, they rode so hard for him. It was the only time my dad and my uncle was, like, watched wrestling with me was when Booker T was on and shit with their country-ass accents, but they from Harlem Heat. But, like, yo, any type of, like, goodwill that he ever had with me, like, his recent shenanigans with going in on going in on Naomi, uh, going in on fucking Charlotte, I mean, not Charlotte, fucking Sasha, all these black people that he goes in on, like, it may, I can't get down with that shit. Like, I'm not going to pretend like I do, like, to me, it's the cooniest coon shit that ever did coon, and I got blocked on Twitter for saying that. But, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, that shucky ducky quack quack and all that shit. He's a fucking character of what a black person is in real life. He's what, in the mind of an old white dude, black people talk like. Like, fuck Booker T, bro. <laughs> okay, I have, to, I have to ask you a serious question then, because looking at it from that perspective, what you were just saying Booker T's doing now, let's talk about Apollo Crews, the 2021 uh i see title reign when he was doing that as well he was he was portraying a character i i, I don't need to say anything other than the 2021 apollo cruise i see title run you guys know exactly what i'm talking yeah. about ready set go yeah <laughs> the biggest missed opportunity of the year Agreed. and i stand by that because look at the star know, he is now in nxt man like bona fide star uh, great but it's like that and i said i said this on our show too that's who he is. If you look up Apollo Cruz, he's really Nigerian. You can't even pronounce his name. Right. That man is really Nigerian to the core. So it's like he's embracing that. 
and it, 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 it's a serious toll. You even gave him a heater in Dabakato. Mm -hmm. Like, that could have been, he could have elevated him to a main event level heel. And they just dropped it, and they took him off TV, shipped him back to NXT. That was such a missed opportunity. And the way it started with him and Big E, that, that feud went on perfectly. Mm -hmm. you, you, put, you put Apollo over, he gets his IC title run. You could have had him hold that title for as long. He could have had him set a record with that title run. There, there was so much that you could have had with that that they just said, oh, we just, to me, we just we was, don't want to do it. I think it was the backlash and they got scared and dropped it. But like to me, like for Apollo Crews, that was the most natural he seemed on the mic in the entire time that I've seen him in WWE. Like even with the accent and all that, like he felt, like you said, like it felt authentic for the first time ever. Cause to me, he's smiley nigga to me. Like, I think he's terrible on the mic. I think he should never have a microphone ever. I think that he should be in a stable <laughs> or have somebody with him. But like that Nigerian shit, like you could tell he felt it and it felt real to him and it felt like he could get behind it. And I think that they got scared because of so much backlash on the accent shit. But like nigga, motherfucking fuck, Kofi was Jamaican for fucking six months. You know what I'm saying? Like it happens. Like, and then the same thing okay. happened. He just stopped using the accent one day on TV, and it was just right. gone. And that's yeah. what happened with they, Apollo. He just showed up yeah, one day not they, using it, and it was gone. They definitely dropped the ball on that one, and that could have been something dope. But I think, like I said, the times were different. We, that was right when we were in the middle of all the like Black Lives Matter stuff, and you know what I'm saying? Like it was. I understood it. I understood why they did it, and I also understood why they stopped doing it too. So, like, I don't normally. I, I'm. I'll definitely shit on WWE anytime I can when they have something good and don't like, like use it. On. But like, well, yeah, right. But that time, like, I'm. I don't give them much. I don't give them much heat for that because of so much, how much like racial shit and tension was going on then. And then you just got this dude that's been American for five years, and all of a sudden he's talking in an accent like. I get, I get it. Like they're like, you know what? Mm, shit's not really cool right now. Maybe we shouldn't do this now. You know what I'm saying? Like, so like, I don't give them too much backlash for like cutting it. You know, just like how they did. I just, I, I liked it over, like you said, the whole smiley, just happy to be here, motherfucker. I, 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 I can't stand anybody that does that gimmick. So especially with him, I just, it, it, it never sat right for me. So this, the fact that they were willing to take that chance and just put that gimmick out there in the first right. place was like, okay, kudos to y'all for that. But again, it's just such a missed opportunity. It got me tight. All right, gentlemen, uh, one thing before we close out the IC champions, um, who you think the best worker was of our list and who you think cut the best promo on our list. The promo I don't feel like can automatically go to the rock because I feel like that's an easy cop out. So somebody not named the rock that cut the next best promo then. Unless you think somebody cut a better promo than The Rock did. Go through the list again. Ahmed, Rocky, The Rock, Godfather, D'Lo, Booker T, Shelton Benjamin, Kofi, Ezekiel Jackson, Big E, and Apollo Crews. Oh, it's, it, that's, it easily comes down to either uh, Kofi or Big E. Like I have to, All those guys on that list were ass on the mic. Like, literally all of them. I would if have taken out it to the Kofi rock. or Biggie if you take yeah, the if rock. You take out. out the rock. All those dudes are garbage on the fucking mic. So, I, you know what? I'm gonna go with Biggie. I'm, I'm if it, if it's not the rock, it's tough. It's tough to say who'd be he's, uh, the one on the mic. But worker, I gotta give it to Shelton. Like oh, I was I, gonna I, say, I, Shelton I, I on my sleepers, D'Lo. D'Lo's a sleeper for that. Pick. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. He'll be right. He'll be right there. But Shelton, like I said, he's just so naturally gifted. You didn't sure. see him have a bad match. It's just like that. That was just an easy one for me. Yeah, the it's D'Lo for me if we're going work in the ring, just because his reign. Like, and like I said, well, I don't really because I don't think a D'Lo is the intercontinental shit. So like, I'm gonna go. You know, what? I'm gonna go with Shelton too. I'm gonna go with Shelton in ring, and then I'm gonna go Big E on the mic. Yeah. Yeah, I'll give him that. Uh, I would say Shelton and D'Lo for the best worker for sure, and Kofi and Big E on the mic. I can agree with that. Uh, we're going to – same song, same dance. We're going to look at the WWE World Championship now. Uh, looking at the list, there are 13. Uh, we've got The Rock, Booker T, Mark Henry, Kofi Kingston being the first African-born champion. Uh, Bobby Lashley, who held the ECW, the WWE, and the Impact World Championships. Big E, Jacqueline Jazz, Alicia Fox, Naomi, 
Sasha Banks, and Bianca Belair. And then I'm going to throw Ezekiel Jackson back in there because Ezekiel Jackson held the IC title and the ECW World Heavyweight title. So he's still on this list, and he's he's coming down there. He's he's in this section. I'm going to ask you Did guys. Did you say Mark Henry? Mark Henry's on that list, yes, sir. Uh, so kind of the same thing, looking through the list. Uh, the Rock is obviously up there, one of the greatest champions of all time. I feel like anything that could be said about The Rock has been said at one point or the other between the three of our shows. I mean, we all know and appreciate and love who The Rock is, right? Facts. Yeah. Uh, Booger T as a world champion, the five-time, five-time, five-time world champion. Uh, did you like Booker T better as a WCW world champion, big gold belt Booker T, or did you like him when he transitioned to WWF Booker T? I liked both, honestly. Like that, and that's what pains me so much is that because WCW Booker T, when he finally got the shot, like. He was the biggest star in that company for the probably the last two years of that company from him holding the US belt and and then eventually getting the big gold belt. Like he kept that he put that company on his fucking back. And like, you know what I'm saying? Like and I felt like WWE missed the opportunity bringing him in like at the end of that. Like imagine if they had brought in like Prime Booker T right when he was still like had popularity and was like probably the biggest wrestler in that company before they shut it down. Like I felt like that was a real mistake that they made bringing him in as a heel too, like up against Austin. But I mean, I know they had the shit on everybody in WCW before they gave him their due. And King Booker was one of my favorite fucking characters. Like I said, I hate this. Like it, it pains me <laughs> that I, that this dude did this to me and make me want to hate him. Cause that King Booker shit with that motherfucking pinky up in the air, that one pink bro, that shit was fire, bro. The he took that about shit King and Booker ran. Now. And that's another two using an accent and all that shit, pretending to be British and shit. Like <laughs> that shit was so fucking fire, and he was so like a Texan he, who says he's from New York, pretending to be British. To be British, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and he brought his old lady in and shit too, and everything. Like that shit was so fire, and like yeah. kind of above his, kind of before his time on the character work and everything. You know what I'm saying? Like that King Booker shit was what Corbin and all them were expiring to fucking get out of that uh, King of the Ring shit. You know what I'm saying? Nobody got more out of it than King Booker. You know what I'm saying? So, like, I loved it. I think that it was dope as hell, and I think that he got to prove that just because he was WCW didn't mean that he couldn't be a good champ. But, like I said, fuck Booker T. Yeah, I I got to give the edge to Booker T and the King Booker gimmick because, one, the last great King of the Ring run that we've seen, I, I don't think they've been able to recapture that magic since then. And it's crazy because I was just I was hating the whole time he was in the middle of the tournament. I'm like, I don't want to see him win this shit. <laughs> and then he goes ahead and he wins it. And he just got so obnoxious. I was hating him more every single week. The more obnoxious it was getting with the accent. But even more so than that, getting back to the world title thing, Batista was hurt. Ray as a world champion was floundering before our eyes. You know, the underdog run was great, you know, but what happened afterwards. And I said the same thing about, you know, people that keep talking about, they want Sammy in the main event. It's like, you got to look at what happens next. Mm -hmm. But, you know, with the world title scene, the way it was, it's like, he didn't feel like anyone else was going to step into that spot and make the main event seem compelling. But the way he came in and did it with this character and then taking the belt off of Ray and then the next going all the way up into November, when he finally lost it, it was like, that was a damn good run, you know. That was worth, you know, worth watching. So, I mean, I, for me, I have to, I had to side with it. Plus, you know, I shuffled between, you know, the later years of WCW towards the end, um, so I didn't get to see as much of it. But I mean, it was good. But I, I felt like once he got over to WWE, it was better. I, my mom worked for Time Warner, so like I got all the WCW pay per views for free. Like I watched Saturday Night Main Event. I did all that shit. So like I was. Heavy WW, WCW back in the day. And like I said, just his progression from... And it's crazy that Terry believed in him. Much as we want to hate on Terry, like he Terry is one of the integral parts on why Booker T eventually became a main event stars because Terry believed in them as a tag team and he believed in Booker T as a single. So, but yeah, it's just... Uh, I don't know. I don't, like, I love Booker. I, I did love Book, Booker. Fuck that nigga, but... Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to think. Like, yeah, I'm trying to think. Name the list again of the men. Uh, I'm going to catch the chat up real quick first. Arian from Bobby. Shucky, shucky, duck, duck. Yeah. Um, what the fuck is that? Yeah, I don't even know. Uh, no, that's Booker. That's Booker's that's Booker. catchphrase. That's just uh, Booker yeah. being Booker. Uh, 
Matt says <laughs> King Booker was well after the death of WCWWE. Uh, we're going to get to our truth, Bobby. Uh, Ron Killings, we'll get to our truth. Uh, then Matt says WWE is about moments, not matches. Uh, matches or runs, Reek. It's a moment, yeah. and that's what is uh, what it's all about in WWE. Yeah, that's what that, that, that that's why I point out Booker because you know that that was his. You know, it was all about that that all that pomp and circumstance with with King Booker every single week. That that was the big thing. Uh, Mark Henry. Uh, Hall of Pain, Mark Henry, big gold belt, Mark Henry, big badass, Mark Henry. Uh, you guys got two cents to throw on on what you think about him uh, at that point in his career. This was around the time he was feuding big with The Undertaker, too. He had the big gold belt a few times. Mark Henry finally got over, finally got that world championship. Uh, what did you guys think about, uh, you know, the world's strongest he took so man? many L's. Like... You think he, he just ate a that, bunch of L's for no reason? Yeah, definitely for no reason. Like, like you said, like he went up against the top guys, and like you can't remember him get, catching an L on any of them. Like, like even though with, with the uh, pink, the salmon jacket on with Cena and all that, bro. Like he took an L in that. Like I, I thought that I'm gonna be honest with you, just in this time, like all niggas was taking L's back then. Like it just wasn't like in a, it. It wasn't for us to be the main guy or the A guy if it wasn't the Rock. You know what I'm saying? So like, I'm mad at it. It's, o- it's over now, and, like, it kind of is what it is. But, like, he took way too many fucking L's, especially all the work he put in to make himself better, to make himself a, uh, a viable option, to make himself a main event player. And, like, it, it just seemed like anytime it was a big one, he lost. From Orton to Undertaker, Cena. He ain't got no, like, it's all L's to all of them. You know what I'm saying? So, like, to me, I think they kind of dropped the ball on that. And I dropped the – I think if they had gave him – Maybe some more bigger wins. You probably could have got a nice baby face run out of him, too, for real. You know what I'm saying? But, like, his greatest success was when he was the angry black guy. I, I think it was it was great for what it was. I think it was five years too late. I think yeah. back in 06 when he was terrorizing everybody, um, was like I said before. Like, the, it, uh, frying pans and shit and all that stuff. Yeah. Right? If, 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 it, if it hadn't been Booker that took a title off of Ray, it could have easily been Mark. He could have crushed Ray. And went on a run until Batista got back, or even after, like that. That was the that was the height of the run for Mark Henry, honestly, because it was the time he was the most destructive and the most intimidating. So I mean, right. uh, that we we took our sweet time getting there, but like I said, it was still good for what it was. He says in 2023, he's still in shape to go. He says he still lifts. He says it on Busted Open. You think you think if Mark Henry got in a, an AEW ring in 2023, you'd want to see that match? Not really, but uh, no. you can tell he is a hell of a lot slimmer and look like even in his face and stuff, you could tell he does look to be a, at a healthier weight. Probably he probably had to drop some weight too, being that he's getting older and shit on his knees and stuff. But like, I mean, the AEW fucking Dustin and all those bums could fucking wrestle. Like, why not? <laughs> Unless it's a retirement match, I don't really care to see it. Uh, we're gonna Kofi Kingston and Big E. Uh, Kofi Mania. Everybody loved Kofi Mania. The buildup. Uh, it would have been him or Ali. He got the biggest pop. Ali, he got the push over Ali coming out of Elimination Chamber going in against Daniel Bryan. We finally got rid of that ugly, hideous, uh, brown, eco-friendly belt. Uh, Xavier Woods and Big E unveiled the WWE title. Uh, Kofi was the first African-born champion. Amazing moment. A few years after that, Big E wins the money in the bank. We got two members of uh, New Day now that have held the WWE title. My question isn't about either of them, though. My question is, does Xavier Woods get a title run? No. (sighs) By himself. Do you think Xavier Woods is a good enough singles competitor to hold the belt by himself? We know the other two guys are. That's without question. Both fantastic workers. Is Xavier the guy by himself? He's too basic in the ring, and he's too good on the fucking mic. Guys like that, you know what I'm saying? Like They never... they're. He might slip and fall into one just because the other two guys have one, but like realistically, those type of guys never get world title consideration. Like shit, he ain't never even really won nothing on his own, honestly. Like he's done other than the King of the Ring, other than the King of Ring shit. But like that was even like kind of lame and played out. But like, nah, I don't think it's ever gonna happen. Uh, I'm gonna say I'm gonna say no for now, only because I feel like there's something missing. You know, uh, like you said, great on the mic. Never been an issue. 
Um, <clears throat> I don't know if it's if it's a finishing move. It's a, it's a particular thing because there's always something that just sets it off. Like with Big E, you got the big ending. You got the his powerhouse move skill set, and you know with Kofi, like I. I can relate to that feel. I was at Mania 35, so I got to see and feel all of that. Was that was it as a moment. electric as it looked? Well, it I was, was watching it, it live, and it blew my mind. It was just like, it was under, the place was just unglued. That's an open-air stadium, and you still felt everything. So, I mean, that was just something really special. But that was that, you know, that, that moment. He lines him up for that trouble in paradise. It's like, there's that little, that last missing piece that there's just... I don't know if it's a move or if it's something else, but that's missing from Woods right now. And yeah. on top of that, it's like he's hurt a lot. Yeah, his, clo- I, his I, I famous move is a flipping clothesline, bro. Like, the backwoods. Even- yeah. I was going to ask, you guys don't like the backwoods, that little schoolboy roll-up he does? <sighs> Again, it's not like – it is. What it's it not. Is. It's not exciting. I'm, ha- I'm halfway that- being facetious, by the way. I think it's kind of <laughs> finishing me. Honestly. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like it's. It's not. It's not exciting. It's not eye popping. It's not eye catching. Like he trouble in paradise. To- fantastic finisher. You exactly. Know? Like absolutely. Yeah. First time he hit it, I was like, damn. They, they, they let him do that. <laughs> and the SOS, like back in the yeah. day when you used to, the SOS was fire too. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know. I just think that. Yeah, I don't think it's ever going to happen. All right, Bobby Lashley. Uh, When I came through my list, ECW, WWE, Impact World Champion. My question for you guys with Lashley, everything he's done in the career, mixed with his mixed martial arts with Bellator, plus this most recent run that saw him win the WWE title two times. um, Hell of a run. Impact, ECW, WWE World Champion. Do you think Bobby Lashley is moving into the kind of conversation where you're talking Mount Rushmore style talk for uh, black wrestlers or people of color? Are He's you already is there. he getting to that level? He's already there to me because like all those guys on that list, you don't think of any of them as world champions. But when you think about Bobby Lashley, you think of him as a world champ. I said he Be looks honest. like a world champion every time I yeah, see him. That's, that's, he looks like, like an old school world champion. Like, yes. think about all those guys. Run that list off. Besides The Rock, let's just take The Rock off, set him to the side. Rock, all Booker, the- Mark Henry, Kofi, Bobby Lashley, Big E, The Women, and then Ezekiel Jackson. Ezekiel Jackson was a big boy. When I went back and looked at some film yeah, no, and looked I'm at some old. pictures, he was a big he dude. He was Ahmed Johnson. Big, he was small guy. Johnson. Yeah. yeah. No, Ahmed was a big guy, is, absolutely. But he was yeah, on the IC title list. But, yeah, I get what you're what, saying. Yeah. I'm, what I'm saying is, of all those black dudes on the list, including Mark Henry and him, the only one you can really say when you think of that person, you think of a world champ, is Bobby. For sure. <laughs> the rest yeah. of those guys, you think tag team championships, you think ECW, you think Intercontinental. Bobby's the one, like, you think, like, the Hurt Business with them suits and shit on coming in every day, like, you think world champion when you think of Bobby and like, I can't believe I'm saying that because I never liked him. I thought he was lame. I still think now this shit now, the fucking him offbeat trying to get the thing down is garbage. He is terrible on the mic as well. Should never be on the mic by himself. But like that her business, Bobby coming in with them glasses on and shit looking like new money. Like he, <laughs> he looks and feels and smells like a world champion. I've, I've had lastly shoehorned in for my Mount Rushmore black champions since he walked in the door because I'll never forget the first time seeing him late 05 breaking onto the scene. He was like, to me, he was the, the, the great black hope, you know, because we hadn't seen a, a, an actual black champion yet. And here comes the guy who's in the mold of Vince's prototype of big beefy dude. He looked like a dude that could get over in the eighties, right? Like he looked like a Hulk Hogan, macho man, ultimate warrior style, big beefcake guy. Right. And he was, he's athletic. He's fast. He didn't need to talk. He didn't need to, you could get him a mouthpiece for that, but it's like, he had everything else and it was perfect. So it's like, as the years were going on, the whole ECW run happens. It's like, okay, listen, as soon as we get him away from that into (laughs) the main roster, competing you know and on raw and everything like that then we'll be fine but it's like uh, when the when the run got cut short and he leaves wwe i'm like damn it's never gonna happen now you know we had booker but it was like that was the guy i was looking at that you know what for years to come he's gonna be in the mix so for him to come back now you know the hurt business winning the wwe title twice even now these feuds with brock it's like that was you know that cemented what i already had for him on that spot to me Facts. Okay, 
the women's side of things. And I apologize. Uh, I said I see champions, but I didn't think about mid-card women champions. So I did omit Jade. I don't know if you guys would count her to be in that TBS title with the IC championship mid-card. But Jade is in my list now. I moved her down here. Jacqueline Jazz, Alicia Fox, Naomi, Sasha Banks, and Jade. Jade Cargill on the rise. I said she was my most improved female wrestler of 2022. She went from being somebody... I was critiquing heavily for being hyper green, really inexperienced uh, 16 months later, being at the top of that card. And I'm just waiting for them to to put the big strap on her at some point. Um, Listing off those names, uh, do we think that we're looking at the Naomi, Sasha, Bianca, maybe the the top three uh, black female wrestlers of all time in our current generation? Yeah, absolutely. Because half of those bitches on that list suck. Sorry. And including and Jade. Let me go ahead and throw Jade in. She's in this current generation as well. Yeah, I'm Jade and Bianca right now are head and shoulders above anything that any of those well, maybe not maybe not Sasha, but even Naomi to a certain extent. Like she's all right. Like well, she's ass on the on the mic too. And like did we ever really take her run serious? Like, did we ever think it would be an extended run? No. So like for me to for me the it's the ball's in the court of Bianca and Jade. I say yes because we're moving out of the stereotypical, you know, uh, right. black and female wrestler. Because you know, like Jazz and Jacqueline was the, you know, the, the black woman that you know with attitude essentially, and that that's how that's how it was when they they came out. Now we're looking at you know them developing their characters and their athleticism. Like Jade is probably the most marketable. Uh, are one of the most marketable women in wrestling right now, bar none, black or white or whatever. And then, you know, Bianca, I mean, you knew she was going to be a talent from, you know, the early years in NXT. But, I mean, the way she's flourished in just, it's only been three years since she came up to the main roster. Like, you look at what she has done in that time period. It's like, that that is just eclipsing everybody. And, you know, got- of course, you got to you gotta put in, you know, Sasha and Naomi because, you know, they, they, they put work into... To just progress, like Naomi was part of freaking Funkadactyls, you know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? I gotta the, give the her dancer girls, yeah, yeah. I gotta give her the nod just off the strength of her coming up from that to being a woman's champion, you know. And and, and Sasha Mercedes, you know, wherever her career ends out, she's already left her mark, you know, being the yeah, first just... woman to do everything. Mm-hmm. To me, it's just them three. The rest of those women, I mean, like I said, no disrespect, but like they were divas, like to me, and I. I didn't stay for their matches. Like, Alicia Fox, like, I used to get attacked by her stands all the fucking time because I said how trash she was and, like, all she was doing was being a stereotypical black woman, uh, angry black lady and shit, like, in her matches. But the thing with Bianca that is different for me, and I never could, I like, it still blew my mind. Like, I took my nephew to Raw last year. We were a couple rows back, you know what I'm saying? Like, we had some pretty decent seats. So, like, I'm not going to lie, it was, like, the upper middle class white people section. Uh sitting like two rows in front of me and I seen these like long ass braids and these homemade Bianca shirts and like just at the corner of my eye I'm thinking it's like these two black girls and then I, I just happen to just like glance and really look at it. it's two little blonde haired blue eyed white girls with the Bianca braid black braid too like they didn't make it blonde they made it black like Bianca sewn into their fucking hair and their mom made them Bianca Belair shirts and these are two blonde haired blue eyed white women in southern Ohio and they were rocking out when fucking uh, Bianca came. And yeah. her mom, their mom was just sitting there clapping and shit. They were so happy. Like, they were screaming so loud. It was making my fucking ears hurt. Like, and it was like, I had never seen, especially, not just in women's wrestling, but like just in general, like two little white girls wanted to be a black girl. Like, that blew my fucking mind. Like, yeah. that shit was dope as hell. And like, and like I said, these were two real white girls, bro. I'm talking about literally blonde hair, blue eyed little white girls. And their mother sold the nigga braid into their hair for them to swing around and they made them shirts for Bianca. Like, and I have ne- I've been going to wrestling shows. I'm almost 40 years old. I'll be 39 in August. I've been going to wrestling shows for almost 20 years. I have never seen anything like that in my entire fucking life. And it was probably the dopest thing I've ever seen in a crowd at a wrestling show. Uh, yeah. hundred percent. Like I, I th- there's just something to be said when you, when you transcend all the barriers and stuff right. like that, and you just you just become a, a a star on your own, like you know, like I said, Bianca they don't was say always going to be your name. That's exactly, a, you know what I'm saying? Like they don't say right. black before your name. 
Right. It's like you you knew that that this was going to be, you know, a, a talented performer. You knew she was going to be in the mix, but just you didn't see this. You didn't see the main events of WrestleMania and, you know, the the, the all this this all the girls wanting to dress up like her, everything like that. It's just you didn't see that initially. And she's just done it and made it look easy. At only three years in, that, that that's crazy. I'm looking through the chat real quick. Bobby's doing Bobby things, pissing every female off in a 60 mile radius from wherever his stench is coming from. Oh, uh, man. Bianca, in my opinion, is up there with Charlotte as maybe the most athletically gifted and talented women wrestlers of all time. Uh, mm. I'm going to ask you guys why I keep reading through my head and giving you the highlights. Do you think Bianca and Charlotte are kind of getting to that range where it's not, and Rhea as well? Uh, where it's not just about being a great women's wrestler, they're just getting to that point where they're just great wrestlers. I think it, it Charlotte and Bianca are to me two of the same. Mm -hmm. And I, I've said this on, on on the show a few times. I don't think Bianca has much time left in wrestling. I think that the the star that she's becoming, she's gonna find herself doing something else sooner rather than later. You know, uh, she's going to leave her mark and she's probably going to go off and do something else. So because of that, I think we have to see Charlotte and Bianca main event at WrestleMania at some point in time. It's not going to be this year, obviously, but somewhere down the line, we have to see that happen because they may go down as being the two best women in all of WWE that have ever competed. Like Charlotte has such a, 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 a such a large boots to fill. And she wasn't even intending to do that. That was her brother's dream. Right. So it's like for her to have caught on to this so naturally and, you know, whether people love her, people hate her, it's like she's done what she needed to do and continues to do that. And, you know, for Bianca, on the other hand, it's like they've just kind of quietly been, you know, circling around each other. They, they've collided. They've had a few uh, instances here and there. They had, a, I think they had a little match on NXT before. But them having a proper match, a proper feud needs to happen because they're going to wind up being 1A and 1B when it's all said and done. Everyone else is, is you know, around. They're in the mix. You know, you got Becky, you got Bailey. you know, uh, mentioned Sasha and everything like that. You know, they're all out there. But these two are that that to me is like that 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 rocks that rock uh, Austin, you know, that uh, of this generation. Yeah. That, that's you said it moving uh right along from the world champions we're gonna i'm going through some honorable mentions uh guys that held major world titles or mid-card titles and other promotion or gals uh r-truth held the nwa world title a.r fox held the evolve world title in 2013 jay lethal ring of honor jonathan gresham has held ring of honor czw uh, he's won world gold a few places. Leo Rush has held the CZW uh, IWGP Junior Heavyweight Championships. Uh, Alex Kane, uh, huge, uh, huge star right now in MLW. He was the Openweight National Champion for a long time. Uh, AC Mack was the IWTV Indie Wrestling World Champion, and he was also the first openly gay world champion in the sport of pro wrestling. Uh, just some honorable mentions. Did you guys have anybody that wasn't on my list that you can think of that held a world title, maybe an impact new Japan that I was missing? Uh, uh, anybody Gresham, like Gresham that? and Jay lethal were the two I had for sure. Like those are the, yeah. those were right there at the top of my list for sure too. Uh, yeah. AR Fox. I'm a big AR Fox guy here recently seeing him get the push in AEW. Uh, I, I got into him when I was interviewing Alex it was supposed to happen like two years ago, and I found out who A.R. Fox was then because A.R. trained Alex Kane. Um, shameless plug, go listen to the Alex Kane interview on the YouTube. Primo, great guy, fantastic worker with MLW. Uh, but some of these guys, like R-Truth, for instance, tenured guy, won an NWA world title, uh, a 58 bajillion time 24-7 uh, champion, tag team champion, U.S. champion, intercontinental champion. He follows me, botch bots and chair shots, and the boss bitch. Uh, I mean, how much how much more love can we give our truth right? He's he's on our, our Young Kings Wrestling throne. He is a Hall of Famer to us. He is the fountain of youth. Agreed I mean, I, to all I, of that. The fact that he was an NWA World Champion, I remember watching that back in the day and not even processing the right. fact that that was the same belt that 
Dusty Rhodes, the Hell, the Ric Flair, oh, Hell, fucking Ricky like, the Dragon. Yeah, all these greats and fucking R Truth. I'm like, hell yeah, give. Fuck yeah. yes, R Truth. Fuck yes. yes. R Truth, Ron Killings. <laughs> Ron yeah, Killings. Man. Yeah. Yeah, that 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 was just something special, man. Mm-hmm. It's like that that was another situation of like you not needing to like put your own spin like that. That was Ron. That's his character. That's him. That's like it's not filtered or anything like that. That was just straight up this man being who he was. He wrapped himself down to the ring every time. Like that 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 was as straightforward as you can get. You no, know, what I saying? hated and, the I hated WWE and R Truth for a long time, like because I did watch impact and tna when it first started like and i had in my head that's who he was you know what i'm saying like even after the road dog shit like he had become such a serious performer and really fucking like stepped his game up and became a world champion and then come back to the wwe and is fucking a clown for the most part but like now that i now that i'm old enough more mature enough to understand like this motherfucker's still on tv <laughs> like he's the only nigga that we can say that's still on tv weekly and that they, well, not now, but like we had no other black person on TV for about that was on TV every week except for our truth. Our truth yeah. wrestled for WWF sure. during the Attitude Era to put right. a, to Can't put quit. a time like yeah, That's like what I'm to saying. put it that far back. This man has been wrestling in WWE, given the the TNA stand for the, the, those couple of years. He's been in WWE for twenty six years. Yeah. He didn't get the the red carpet rolled out the same way Cena did. He didn't get the same standing ovation the Undertaker did. And I'm not saying our truth is the Undertaker or John Cena. What I'm saying is looking at the career longevity to be able to stay for the highest rated companies as long as this man has. You have to give him credit for doing that. That's Absolutely. hard. And that's what wrestling. I'm saying. Yeah. That that's what made me turn it around because I'm thinking about all these dudes that are like should still be in the WWE and all these people that got fired and all this other shit and like our truth made the cut every fucking time. That's real nigga shit. Let's go. Bama says that he's 100%. up there on his uh Mount Rushmore with Brock Lashley, Ron Simmons, our truth. Uh how do you feel about Bama's top four? I'm not mad at that because yeah. like there is nobody that's had the longevity and I, a lot of times people get penalized for longevity but like that man made it through like you said almost 30 years with this company like he didn't seen it all been it all fought them all everything like i'm i I wouldn't as funny as that sounds like i wouldn't i wouldn't poo poo fucking r truth being on the black black uh mount rushmore and people want to talk about kurt angle and uh how ironic is it that uh, a jewish guy wearing an mjf scarf is sitting here arguing for black men to be on the mount rushmore but kurt angle was in atlanta in 96 but bobby lashley was in the olympics in 2000 you yeah. know what i mean like they were he was right there along with it so you look at lashley he was a uh, an olympian he's a world champion multiple times over he won the same world title belts that kurt angle did so i mean you have to start looking at him as being not necessarily equals. They both did great things for the business, but like sometimes these guys are getting left off of these greatest of all time lists when they're doing the exact same things that your Kurt Angles did, that your Stone Colds did. It's just yeah. the where they were at at the business at the time. When you're going against uh, the Rock and your Stone Colds and your John Cena's, you can be the absolute best. But when you're going against a once in a generation talent, it's hard to to shine against it, right? Welcome to being black, Will. That's yeah, what happens. Man. That's that's true. That's yeah, what you, uh, just, you just put his resume up against Kurt Angle, and Bobby Lashley is not nowhere near looked at how Kurt Angle is. And this man, pill popping, he was only really in the WWE a few years. He was in TNA more, and still like his 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 stance and and stature is higher than Bobby Lashley's. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 the broken neck. It's the perk angle. I mean, I I, I listen. All credit to him. The man truly was a wrestling machine. Like I, I told you, I'm watching, was fun. Yeah. watching off the top of a six-sided yeah. cage and shit. That was top a lot 10. of fun. In, in my top ten for sure. Yeah, <laughs> but it's like if you if you had them two side by side, put them both in their primes. It's like who you really go with in that. In that, it's, it's you, you can't. No one you can't tell. about that. Like you don't think about that. Yeah. Uh, Bama brings up a good question. Did we ever have Lashley and Kurt ever have a chance to do a full-on shoot match? Uh, I was going to bring up Xavier Woods and uh, uh, Gable. 
in the uh, the Royal Rumble when we were talking about Xavier earlier because he got into that. They did like that 30 second shoot in the middle of the match that I thought was genius. Yeah. Uh, but I don't recall if we ever saw Lashley and Kurt Angle getting a shoot in a, in a match. I, yeah, I don't think it was a shoot. They've had, I think they've had some, uh, like an impact they had in like a match or two. But uh, shoot wise, I don't think that ever happened. Yeah. All right. The, the last little thing I'm going to touch on, uh, we also got to throw in JYD. As a territory guy, uh, he didn't. He held territory titles. Uh, he held mid card titles in WCW. But I feel like you can't talk about uh, people of color who helped elevate the the game and not bring up JYD. He carried uh, mid south and the Louisiana territories through the seventies and eighties. So uh, much respect to JYD there. Uh, yeah. The the last thing I'm going to bring up is Sweet Georgia Brown because the she Ooh. was brought up in the title of the episode all the way through to Ron Simmons in the nineties. George, Sweet Georgia Brown. Was the uh, she was under the learning tree of Bobby's favorite female wrestler, Fabulous Mula. Um, she she was brought up there. She was booked by uh, Mula and her husband. She was the first uh, black female wrestler. She was given the title in the WWA in their indie promotion because they had an indie promotion and they had a Cali promotion. And WWA was historically known. They gave Bearcat Wright the first title in 1963. Uh, so you could say Bearcat Wright was the first black champion in a major promotion if you look outside of the WCW. But that's getting into history and semantics. But WWA was historically known for doing this. They gave Sweet Georgia Brown the title in 1962 at a time when, just to be honest, it wasn't about just being a woman in 1962 but it was about being black and a woman in 1962 but the promoter still said we're going to put the belt on her uh, i know it's hard to speak on because none of us were alive then but you guys had family that were that that lived through that stuff to to say that she was able to ascend to the top at a time when nobody wanted to see it speaks volumes right right yeah absolutely i mean sometimes star it doesn't matter the present the people around her whatever sometimes just a star can't be dimmed and I feel like that's kind of what which, which she was. Kind of like really around that same time, like uh, was it Jack Johnson and all that, a brown bomber and all that. Like sometimes you just can't deny. Bearcat, Bobo Brazil, it. Art Thomas, Ernie Ladd, all of these guys, 60s, yeah. 70s, 80s. But none of them got that push into JCP, WCW, WWF. Right. I will say, um, and I, I love that you brought this up because Sweet Georgia Brown deserves her flowers. But I'm going to mention another name <clears throat> that uh, we actually, uh, well, I'll, I'll give it to TC did it. He found uh, this one during his research. Uh, Ethel Johnson. Okay. Because uh, she was actually uh, an African-American women's champion in the 50s. Oh. Way back when. And this is what I, I, I get credit to my co-host because, you know, he did his research and just a couple years ago. Uh, made that viral tweet, and if you haven't seen it, go on YK Wrestling and check it. The pin tweet mm -hmm. uh, is some footage of her. Yeah. And, and they, they, I mean, they're running the ropes and killing it. Her and a, a, a whole group of black women's wrestlers in Boston, mind you, in the 50s. Right. Um, you know, we're, we're just main eventing shows out there, and, you know, they, they weren't spotlighted, but. Um, uh, there was a documentary a couple years ago out called uh, Lady Wrestler, and uh, we actually interviewed uh, the guy who, who made the movie and uh, directed it, Chris Bournet. Um, he shed a lot of light on it. It, it was out in Ohio. So um, a lot of these women, you know, they don't get talked about enough. So I think that that's important to point that out. You know, you Sweet Georgia Brown, you know, that that's – that's your, your your big, you know, your first major name that you hear about, the connection to Fabulous Moolah and everything like that, you know. So, so we acknowledge all of that, you know. But there's just this is a whole, like, line that out there that a lot of people never heard of before. And I always love to bring it up this time of year because, like, I didn't know about it until, like, TC had posted that tweet and it went viral. You had current wrestlers that were tweeting about it and retweeting. It was just like... It was a major thing, so uh, it, it's, it's something that just I, I like to bring up. During, I'm not even going to lie to you right now, and I'm not making it up. Allison's sitting beside me. I have chill bumps right now because of the fact that you brought something up from the wrestling world that I have no knowledge about. I've never wow. heard the name Ethel Johnson before. So to me, this is like eye-opening because I'll, I'll give TC his roses, man. When you get into the 40s and 50s in wrestling, that research is hard. There's yeah. not a lot of video. There's a lot of that is no. just written and word of mouth stuff. So it's not completely outside the realm that I missed something. 
You know, like, so that's what's exciting to me is because this history, that means for 2024, I'm going to have a whole new list of shit to talk about. You know what I mean? Like, this is just going to be a rabbit hole for me to go down because I did my research and I felt like I had, I I had a list ready. I felt prepared. I was ready to roll. When TC dropped that shit, that shit was crazy, bro. Like the the traction it got. Yeah, I'll, I'll look it up right now as soon as we get off air because that's exciting for me for something that I genuinely have no knowledge of. Because when you start getting, like I said, you get into that 40s and 50s, like you're getting back into the carnival days where, you know, not only right. was kayfabe real, people didn't know kayfabe was a thing. They were right. speaking in carny. They were using a language that nobody, like, there's only a handful yeah. of people that still even speak the language now. Yeah, yeah, and it was it was so educational for me too because it's like I was like you, I hadn't heard of anyone beyond that point. And so yeah. when TC posted that 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 tweet and that video, I was like, wow, this is really crazy. And then I watched the documentary before we had the interview, and it was like, man, this this is really something that it's like not a lot of people, especially if we're talking about you know you know black history and wrestling. It's like you're never gonna know about this, you right. know, at, at that time. So yeah, that that was that was definitely special. I appreciate the hell out of that. That's that's one of those moments where I like doing these kinds of specials when I bring people on that are knowledgeable. They always say a host has an easy job when he brings on people that know what they're talking about. So I knew having you and RN would be like, that would make the job easy tonight. Um, Ron Simmons, kind of rounding out the conversation. The, the first black man to hold a major world title in a major promotion, WCW. He was in the 90s. Uh, do you think that says something for the time period we're talking about? We're going from the 50s now all the way through the 90s before a black man held a major world title. That's 40 years before they finally got that push. What do you guys think about that that gap? And then when Ron Simmons got it, it was almost like off to the races because we'll go back to the other list. Starting in the 94 range, you had Ahmed's and all these guys starting winning titles. Uh, so looking at Ron, was he the catalyst that kind of was that final ignition to to get, you know, as, as generic as it sounds, was he the catalyst that finally got the black man over in major commercial wrestling? Yeah, because they uh, finally yeah. got a chance to see that if we that we can do it. Like, cause that is the same thing. Like with the black quarterback thing. Like, it's like, we're not mentally able to, to hold these top positions and to hold these top spots. And Ron threw that shit right out the window. Like everyone knew he was the man. Everyone knew he was the real deal on and off the fucking, (laughs) the field, the ring, any of that. He was the fucking truth. So like, yeah, he he did get kind of get that started. Like made us, made it possible for white people, honestly, to believe that we could be world champions. Yeah, I think um, 100% he, he was a huge catalyst because, you know, he was he was going in and putting on some great work before he won the title. And it was just like, you got to look at that moment when it happened. Like, guys were falling over the, the fence. And, like, you just saw people genuinely showing joy. It's like, it, it, I, I could relate it back to what I, when I was at Mania, when I saw Kofi win. It was like... That was a moment, you know, people were just like feeling it in their emotions about it. Like it was a moment in time. So it's like, you know, for, you know, he might not have been the guy people expected, but he was the right guy at the right moment. And I think that moment just kind of, it it took a while for us to get more consistent on it, but that was something that had us in the right direction. All right, gentlemen, I think we did all the damage we could do for one night. Uh, Rico, I'm going to tee you off, uh, plug your stuff, put yourself over, uh, tell everybody what young Kings wrestling's got going on and coming down the pipes for everybody. Yeah, we, uh, you can find us at young, uh, young Kings wrestling, YK wrestling on everywhere, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, you can find our, our, um, podcasts on all streaming platforms, Spotify, anchor, uh, Google podcasts. Uh, we haven't been uploading live episodes on, on, um, YouTube on the video versions. We've just been kind of clipping it. So we've been uh, kind of just working the algorithm a little bit, you know, just answering some questions, some particular topics that we post up there. Uh, but, yeah, all social media is up there. You can find me at Recapit24 on Instagram and on Twitter. And uh, I also my my show, The Havoc Hour, where I talk sports and entertainment, uh, all streaming platforms as well. It's kind of going on ice right now. I've got some other projects coming up that I'm working on, but all that content is up. And also uh, we've got merch and everything like that at YKWrestling.com. So you can check that out as well. It's Black History Month. Get yourself the NWO-inspired Black Lives Matter tea. All funds are donated directly to black families and uh, people going through whatever. There's a lot going on right now. You know, police 
police brutality and all kinds of other issues. We put that money directly into funds to families who can need them. All great causes. All right. I was reading the chat. Allison put Bobby in timeout and I was trying to figure out what the <laughs> fuck was as- happening while I was listening to Reed plug his stuff. I was like, Oh Lord. <laughs> uh, oh, RN, what's going on at the rewind, man? What's new and exciting. What's up with root four kennels and mean jelly bean. Uh, we moved the rewind to Tuesday nights moving forward. So definitely check us out Tuesday nights, at 8, 8, 8, 8, 8 30 PM Eastern time. Uh, me and jelly bean Productions. We just dropped our Valentine's day song, uh, love on the spectrum. Definitely go check that out. I'll shoot you the video. Rick is fucking hilarious. I, I, I've seen the clip. <laughs> uh, so, you know man. what I'm saying? That's just our little tradition. Then uh, Route 4 Kennels, I got a couple litters. I actually got three litters dropping this week. My brother is going to be a fucking madman and not getting any sleep, and I'm going to laugh at him. But we always got we got anything you need. We sell American Bullies, Frenchies, Toy Poodles, French Mastiffs, and we're working on monkeys. Look, if you need me to hold one of those female puppies to you really to breed her, let me know. Yeah, all right. We, we'll get that. We'll get the friends and family plan jumping. We, we got that working. All right, gentlemen. Well, I appreciate your comment on, man. This is a fantastic episode. Like I said, I knew exactly what I was getting when I asked the two of you to come on. Uh, I knew y'all would be knowledgeable and you'd make it easy on me. Um, but now as we close another episode of Botch Pods and Share Shots, I'm going to take a minute. Thank you for listening. Remind you to go wherever you do anything on the internet. Like, follow, subscribe, unsubscribe, then subscribe again. Leave a comment telling me how great I am or how terrible Bobby is. He's still in timeout. Either way, it helps the algorithm. It helps find new listeners. If you're feeling really generous and be one of the VIP people, head over to Rivet City Radio and donate to the Rivet City Radio Podcast Network. You don't, you get some fantastic swag. We used to get some fantastic guests. It's a win-win. For the young king, Tyreek Yates. For RN from The Rewind, I am the Will Gray. Thanks for stopping by and listening, my people.